morning to everyone. Welcome to the Planetary's World Gathering. Uh, from Lisbon to the world, it's the biggest uh, and most impressive event when it comes to sustainable growth, sustainable innovation in the world. It's going to be two exciting uh, days and uh, also uh, with uh, through his own ecosystem Planetary's and also with Planetary's unit generation we will uh, promote a program from a sustainable change in uh, 10 years for the Portuguese territory in the uh, first step and the first step will be taken uh, today here in Lisbon. A warm welcome then to all the guests and, uh, that are here today with us and uh, also all the thousand planeteers that uh, are live with us by uh, streaming all over the world in this uh, special event that is uh, really starting now. My name is uh, Pedro Pinto. I am a journalist for uh, TVI, the Portuguese uh, television that uh, is uh, very, very honored to be a partner uh, in the international broadcast of uh, Planetary's World Gathering. I will be your host for the next couple of hours. In more than uh, 50 countries, we will gather more than uh, 1,000, 10,000 planetaries and we will debate sustainable growth for the next years finding and uh, developing solutions that will protect the environment and balance social conditions. Well, our, um, over the next two days, um, Altis Arena, this place here, will be uh, the center of a global discussion that will count with 100 speakers, more than 70 startups and uh, 100 investors. We will be talking about uh, key problems that uh, the world must face for the next years. There's uh, pollution, climate change, the decline of uh, biodiversity, poverty, poverty, education, and uh, anger with the clear purpose of a change. It's time to uh, bring uh, live our first guest uh, of the morning and our first topic. Planeteers and Planetary Boundaries. Professor Mohan Monasingh will be joining us from Sri Lanka. He is the Nobel Peace Prize winner 2007. Bom dia. Greetings. Ayu Bohan from Sri Lanka. I'm going to talk to you today about how planeteers can save the planet. Let me first share my screen with you. Excellencias, eminentes colegas, convidados e jovens amigos. Muito obrigado pelo convite aos organizadores do PWG, especialmente ao dirigente Sergio Ribeiro, e maravilhoso estar convosco, mesmo via vídeo, na capital verde da Europa. Bela Lisboa, beleza pura. As a strong supporter of Planeteers since the beginning, I urge you all, especially young people, to participate actively in the Planeteers World Gathering. Your personal commitment will help to save our wonderful planet. We already know integrated solutions to major problems of sustainable development. We can use the balanced inclusive green growth or BIGG pathway and the sustainomics framework. They provide win-win solutions for people, for planet, for prosperity. We can overcome serious problems if we all work together now to implement the practical solutions. There is no excuse for inaction or delay. PWG and Planetier's new generation is the latest world happening among the key events that have shaped SD in the past. Despite the global pandemic, they are the pioneers showing the way forward to the new normal. Now the world famous faces multiple problems that interact, poverty and inequality, resource shortages, pandemics, weak leadership, financial problems, conflicts, and so on. PWG vision for a sustainable world on the economic side wants to have prosperity, but 
resource efficiency as well. On the social side, basic needs of everybody has to be met, ensuring also peace and harmony and social justice. And on the environmental side, we would like to live within the sustainable capacity of our planet. And for this, we need to implement 17 sustainable development goals and achieve the 2030 agenda. Let's take an example of the problems created by overconsumption, inequity, and poverty. There is a concept called ecological footprint of humanity, which says what are the total amount of environmental resources we need to support human lifestyles. In 2012, we needed one and a half planets Earth to sustainably support us. And by 2030, we will need the equivalent of two Earths to be sustainably supporting us. But clearly, we cannot go on like this. Who is doing all this consumption? The infamous champagne glass tells us that in 2010, 85% of all consumption was done by the top 20 percentile of the world's population. And the bottom 20 percentile only consumed 1.4%. And if you look at the wealth ratio between the top 1% and the bottom 1%, it's 3,000 to 1. Just imagine that in 2018, the 28 richest people in the world owned more wealth than half the world's population. And today, even 800 million people are hungry, one in nine. So if you put these things together, you see that when the rich are already using more than one planet worth, where are the resources to raise the poor out of poverty? So we have 70 years of unmet goals and broken promises since the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1947. And this fine document had all the elements of the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015. So we have not moved very far in 70 years. Now, how do we find solutions to these problems? These are complex, they are interlinked, but we have the sustainomics framework and balanced inclusive green growth. The framework was first presented in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, and in 25 years, it has progressed and been applied worldwide. I personally have supported Planeteers and Sergio Ribeiro from the early days because their activities, including PWG and PNG, are very good examples of applications of many ideas of sustainability that I helped to develop. Let us take the first core concept. PWG, PNG builds on a strong tradition of personal commitment of empowerment and action. It's called climbing the mountain. The peak of sustainable development is covered with clouds. It's mysterious. We don't know where it is. But if we keep climbing one step at a time, we will reach the peak. And this is because making development more sustainable is a personalized strategy. And Unsustainable activities are easy to identify and eliminate. For example, we switch off the light when we leave the room, we can turn off the tap, we can plant a tree and so on. And we can eliminate these in our personal lifestyles, but at the company level, at the city level, at the nation level, and at the global level. The second core concept is equally important. PWG harmonizes the sustainable development triangle for balance and integration. We need economic prosperity, but we also need environmental protection, and we need social empowerment and inclusion. And it is the balance of the three elements that it is very important. And the th third core concept, PWG helps us transcend boundaries in our own mind to innovate and have fresh ideas. So we need to replace unsustainable values and unethical values. We need to think in terms of multidisciplinary terms. We think, need to think in terms of 
the whole planet rather than our own neighborhood. And in terms of decades or centuries rather than days, and we need to work with many stakeholders. So greed, selfishness, and violence are out. We need selflessness, enlightened self-interest, and so on. The fourth core concept is, of course, implementation. And PWG is very action-oriented. There are a whole range of analytical tools and policy options and many case studies, which we'll, we learn about in the coming uh, days of this meeting. Also, let us keep in mind that there is an implementation triangle. And that transcends the stakeholder boundaries of business, civil society, and government. And by catalyzing the interactions, we can help young people implement sustainable development in Portugal and the whole world by working with civil society, business, and government. Now, let us talk about the balance inclusive green growth path, or PWG. It has strategies, policies to reduce social and environmental harm due to growth. If you look at the environment on the vertical axis, and let us say it is per capita greenhouse gas emissions, the climate risk, and on the horizontal axis, the development level per capita income. If you're a poor country, you have low emissions, but also low GNP. If you are a rich country, you have high emissions well above the safe limit, but you also are rich. And middle income countries are in the middle. But in 1992, what we realized was these things were not harmonized. And that is why we have this situation. There is no balance or integration. So the first thing in the mid 1990s we worked on was rebalancing economy and environment. Uh, and this is called green growth. And for the rich countries, it essentially means dematerialization, that is maintaining the same quality of life and consumption, but with using less natural resources. But this is not enough. We have all these emerging and developing countries, and they have to follow the green growth tunnel without going up the same profligate curve of the rich countries. And this is through innovation, through learning from the experience of the OECD and other countries. And this is countries like China and uh, Sri Lanka, also rebalancing economy and environment. And the third element is, of course, balancing green growth with pro-poor inclusive activities. So that is, you have balanced inclusive green growth, inclusive, which is socially inclusive, green for environment, and growth for the economy. And that is a fully balanced triangle, and PWG and PNG are using social and business innovators to find this path and it can work with food, water, energy, and many other areas. Now, let us also remember that a sustainable society needs both sustainable consumption and sustainable production. So here are some insights that I have got from working with CEOs and senior managers of major multinationals, all the way from chemicals, supermarkets, oil and gas, biotech, mining, uh, even wine and cork producers from Portugal. They all agree that sustainability and triple bottom line is the wave of the future and resource efficiency or green growth is a win-win starting point. And let us also talk about sustainable consumption, where if we think of that what one third of the world's food supply is wasted while 800 million people go hungry. This rich family in uh, Europe can live the same lifestyle, but with less packaging and less, less wastage of food. And this family can raise their consumption on the BIGG path so that they have a better lifestyle. And finally, let me also talk about how PWG, PNG 
can in fact help Portugal become a role model leading the way to sustainable development. You have the economy, the technology resources and skills. You have a society with good social capital, peace and harmony. And you have a mature culture that respects the environment. You are a super con connector in a multipolar world, linking south and north and east and west. You are a sustainable development leader which can build government, business, society, uh, civil society, and uh, partnerships. And you can lead the way to the 2030 by implementing the sustainable development goals. And of course, PNG will help to accelerate disruptive training and innovation among the youth using technology to transform society. Let me also remind you that PWG PNG can help youth to promote peace by appealing to the heart. In 2012, I launched a group called Sustaino Musica at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. These are music lovers and they reach hundreds or thousands of young people at rock concerts and other things, which is a very effective tool. So finally, we remember that sustainable consumers and sustainable producers start small. If we bring them together, eventually that approach will spread through society and we have a sustainability culture and this behavior will spread throughout society. And that is the PWG approach. And finally, I would like to mention that if you want to save the world, you have also to start by saving yourself. If you need to have a happy, contented, and sustainable lifestyle, build this personal sustainable triangle, which includes work, job, and career, but also health and fitness, and finally, your social links, family, friends, and community. If you keep all three in balance, you will be a well-balanced person. So let me end by saying that we have in fact, a hopeful message for the world. We have multiple problems. In fact, COVID-19 is a reminder that the world is very unsustainable and our encroachment into wildlife habitats, dense depopulated cities and rapid travel has created enormous problem with the pandemic, but we can solve all these problems together. And we can use the sustainomics framework and inclusive green growth to reach a safer future, deal with multiple crises in an integrated way with bottom-up leaders and innovators and PWG PNG will help to create these new values and behaviors for a 21st century global eco-civilization. We have faith in youth who are our future leaders. Let me end with this final Pali blessing from Sri Lanka. May the rains come in time, which is environment. May the harvest be bountiful, which is the economy. May the people be happy and contented. May the king be righteous, which is social. So many hundreds of years ago, they knew about this triangle. We are just rediscovering this ancient truth. Thank you very much. Ayuboan, Suti, and Bonnoiti. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your uh, sensible and uh, um, uh, well-deserved words that uh, we were all expecting. Professor Mona Singh uh, will be talking uh, in a few minutes. Now let me uh, call our second guest of the morning. We'll have the presence of uh, Professor Joan Rockström from Sweden. He's the vice chair of the scientific advisory board of the Postdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's also chair of the Hertz System Visioning Task Team of uh, International Council for Science and will be talking about planetary boundaries. Dear friends, the Planeteers World Gathering occurs at a very important moment. 
the year 2020 is the super year. It's a super year not only because it's the five years of accounting for all world nations after signing the Paris Climate Agreement. It's also five years into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the roadmap, the Agenda 2030 for world development and lifting all people out of poverty and having good economic growth in the world. But it's also a year of reckoning. All science shows that this is the year when we have to start bending the curves, not only on reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, but also in stabilizing the natural ecosystems on Earth. It is simply the year of grand transformation. It's the year when we have to become planeteers, planetary stewards, navigating our spaceship Earth, in the words of Kenneth Boulding, within its finite and stable boundaries. Because we have reached a completely new juncture, we are today forced to pose the question, are we at risk of destabilizing the whole Earth system? We know the planet, our home, our only home, can exist in three different states. One state is in deep ice age, the state that we've been oscillating in in long 100,000 year periods, which is like minus four degrees Celsius colder than the average temperature on Earth that we've had in the pre-industrial era. It's appeared when we have two kilometers of ice above our heads in the northern parts of the hemisphere. It is the snowball Earth. The other extreme is the hothouse Earth. When we don't have any ice caps, we have a plus four, five, six degrees Celsius warming world. The tropical planet, the last time we were there was like 10 million years ago. Think of it as the dinosaur Earth, the hothouse planet that cannot support human beings as far as we know. Then you have this middle state, this equilibrium state that we call an interglacial state, the state that we've been privileged to be in since we left the last ice age 12,000 years ago. These interglacials that I call the Garden of Eden is the period that the planet has been oscillating in a kind of a limit cycle over the past 1.2 million years, some six to eight times. In fact, we know today from the latest climate modeling at my own institute, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, that over the past three million years, the entire so-called Pleistocene geological epoch, the planet has been oscillating between ice age and warm periods within a very narrow limit cycle from the coldest state, minus four degrees Celsius, deep ice age, to a maximum of up to plus two degrees Celsius above our pre-industrial average temperature on Earth of roughly 14 degrees Celsius. Can you imagine? Three million years, huge natural variability with forcings from volcanoes and earthquakes and solar forcing changing over the millennia. And still the planet has been regulating itself within this narrow limit cycle of minus four, deep ice age, and plus two, minus four, plus two, almost like an harmonious symphony for three million years. We are now in the blink of geological time, putting this all at risk and just shooting ourselves right to the ceiling of the maximum temperature we've ever experienced since the last ice age at 1.1 degrees Celsius warming so far and following a path that will take us to above 3 degrees Celsius in just 80 years time. 80 years, it is the time when your children, my children, have adult kids. That is a blink of time into the future. Now, in a recent publication, we show that it's not only the pressures on Earth through the Anthropocene and the Great Acceleration that is causing these risks. It is also that we know that the planet is an interconnected, self-regulating complex system where all the biophysical systems interact. So we depend on stable ice sheets, rainforests, grasslands, temperate forest, coral reefs, Antarctica, Arctic, land glaciers, to be functioning in order to be stable because they provide us with feedbacks that can dampen and cool if we cause warming and forcing. Now we published quite recently a paper showing that nine of the 15 so-called tipping elements that not only regulates the state of the earth system but also have multiple stable states like the Amazon rainforest that can tip over and irreversibly move in a savanna state or that the Greenland ice sheet irreversibly moves into a state where we can no longer stop. It's melting. Not that it would melt overnight, but that it would become irreversible. 
nine of the 15 node tipping elements are showing signs of moving towards a very dangerous point. They're not crossing the tipping points yet, but they're moving in the wrong direction. We are therefore, what we scientifically conclude, in a state of planetary emergency. A planetary emergency is not a doomsday signal, it's not to scare or make people depressed, it is to unleash new ideas and innovation and investments into solutions that we perhaps previously thought were not possible because when you're stuck in a lulled into a comfort zone of incrementality, you cannot see that yes, in an emergency point, you need to put all hands on deck. You need to consider seriously in the next few years to get a global price on carbon, to get a global fund that can invest in carbon capture and storage at large scale, to put an end date on the combustion engine to 2030, say that every nation in the world must have a climate law. Why not agree, as a handful of countries have done, to be at net zero emissions by 2045, to be absolutely certain that we keep the resilience and the carbon sinks in natural ecosystems intact. This is what a planetary emergency can engage and create in an emergence of innovation and action. To guide this whole journey, we, I believe, as planeteers, must have science-based targets that can allow us to stay within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient Earth system that remains in a Holocene-type equilibrium. The Planetary Boundary Framework provides that guidance. These are the nine systems and processes that we scientifically today know with a very high degree of certainty regulates the state of the Earth system. It's not only a stable climate, it is also keeping the living biosphere intact. Water, land, biodiversity and the cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus and water. But it's also assuring that air pollution and aerosol loading and chemicals are handled in a way that they don't threaten the comp composition of our genetic uh, fabric in species from humans to predators in ecosystems. It is about keeping all the systems functioning. We can today quantify these in a relatively high degree of resolution and therefore translating them into operational implementation schemes for businesses, cities, communities, households in the world. In fact, we've come to a point today that scientifically we have been inspired by the Moore's Law. You remember the Moore's Law that became a self-fulfilling prophecy of innovation in the computer industry of doubling the speed every 24 months. In science, or for climate, we have a similar law, what we call the carbon law, that if you look carefully at the IPCC curves, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change curves, to be able to keep ourselves within a Holocene safe space of well below 2, aiming for 1.5 degrees Celsius on average warming, we need to cut emissions by half every decade. That's the carbon law. If we, at every scale, as an individual, as a community, as a business, as a country, as a world, can cut emissions by half every decade, we stand a chance of stabilizing the temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which, at least from the scientific knowledge we have today, would enable us to avoid crossing tipping points of irreversibilities towards a hothouse Earth trajectory. This is a guide inspiring us to innovate and scale novel, renewable, decarbonized, sustainable solutions in food, in construction, in transport, across all sectors in society. It's quite exciting to see in the Exponential Roadmap project that we've been presenting at a number of heads of state and business meetings to show that in most sectors in the world, from agriculture to construction, we have the solutions. It's a question of unleashing the opportunity of scaling through the right policy incentives and having the actors with us from science, policy, community and business. So this is a moment of truth and a moment of raising the ambition but also the implementation of new ideas. And therefore, I would close just by saying that scientifically, in all these risk analyses, the window is, as far as we know, still open for a manageable future that can provide us with a prosperous and equitable future for humanity within planetary boundaries. I think the planeteers meeting and the world gathering that you are setting out for now is an incredibly important moment to keep up that momentum. So good luck in your deliberations 
and um, looking forward to be planeteers together in the decade to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your words, Professor Johan uh, Rockstrom. And now um, let's have a talk uh, live with uh, Professor Mohan uh, Monasink about uh, systemics. Uh, obviously, Professor, it's quite an honor to be uh, live with you again. I hope uh, everything is okay in uh, Sri Lanka. And um, let me ask you about your concept. Uh, Sustainomics uh, has always fascinated me. And um, I would like to ask you if you do still believe that this concept is even more important nowadays that we are facing this pandemic situation. Absolutely. Um, I think the principles of sustainable development that we are quite adequate to face not only COVID-19, but all of the problems. What we need is implementation. And that is what PWG and the young people of this world need to do fast. No delay, no inaction. And I can give you more details about what the sustainomics does and how it is relevant. But let me agree with you, it is even more important in this time of COVID-19, which reminds us that the world is very unsustainable. That human encroachments on wildlife habitat, densely populated cities, and the speed of travel, which are sort of pre-unrelated things, have combined to create a synchronized global crisis, which has brought the whole global economy to almost a standstill. So it is a warning that many other things can happen, but if we implement the sustainomics framework and especially the sustainable development goals, we can overcome all of them together. Sustainomics is even more important nowadays. And uh, I, I would also like to ask you, uh, how do you rate and uh, foresee the future of Portugal when it comes to Sustainomics? Well, I am an old friend of Portugal. I've been coming there many years uh, and I have many friends. I think you have as I said in my speech, the economic assets, a skilled human resource base and technology. You have a good social fabric, peace and harmony, and you have a respect for environment in your culture. So you can be an international hub for implementation of sustainable development already Lisbon is the European lead capital. And we have many other cities which are implementing the principles of sustainability. So by implementing parts of the goals of the SDG at the community, the city level and the national level, we can be an example for the whole world. I think you have a great group and PWG just one example of that future. Thank you so much for your hope about the future of uh, Portugal in Sustainomics here in Lisbon and uh, all over the country. A big hack for you, a big thank you for you, a big hack for uh, Sri Lanka from Portugal and uh, hope to uh, be with you uh, and hope to see you soon. And uh, this is the, the end of the first uh, topic of this uh, morning. A big applause to Professor Mona, Mohan Monasek.